Okay, so this morning I am pleased to introduce George Baker. First saw George speak at the Backyards and Beyond conference in Myrtle Beach a number of years ago, and I'm, I'm happy to have him here in Crested Butte. George it, uh, specializes in executive leadership and works with clients to take action and lead. He has 32 years of municipal fire, EMS, and disaster management experience and 26 years as a chief officer. And now he provides executive level coaching to individuals, groups, and teams to refine their abilities to get out and lead. Uh, Chief Baker understands that successful projects can be predicted by the core energy of the team, the team leader, the stakeholders, and everybody involved. In this session, he's, or in keynote session, he's going to educate us as he entertains and reviews the ups and downs of the collaborative risk reduction programs based on the tenets of the National Cohesive Fire Management Strategy and the, IF, the IA, IAFC Ready, Set, Go program. Please welcome George Baker. I kind of want to watch this. It sounds like an interesting speaker. <laughs> I'm like, wow, I know that guy. Let's just practice it. Okay. So you already heard that, right? But this is the disclaimer. This is what I'm supposed to be giving you. And you can read it if you want to. And here's our commercial. Who has seen this before? You've seen this before. Who hasn't seen this before? Who hasn't seen this before? Wow. This came out, I don't know, five or six years ago when the uh, number one at DOI and number one at the other one, uh, what's the other one, uh, agriculture, they were told by the president to stop the nonsense and start working together. And they formed the cohesive strategy and they formed regional teams and a whole bunch of stuff. So this is what you're supposed to be doing. So you can go back to that slide later if you haven't seen it before. But look at cohesive strategy, look at your regional cohesive strategy, and then look at your neighbors, and look at what we're doing at the Northeast. Because there are monthly newsletters coming out, there's grant announcements, there's all sorts of stuff coming out of the cohesive strategy work. And Ready, Set, Go. Who's heard of Ready, Set, Go? Yay! Good, good, good. So this was something that the IFC, um, Bob Roper, any of you know Bob out of Ventura County, Bob? stole this from Australia after the Black Friday or Black Tuesday, the really bad fires in Australia. And they started to put in Ventura County, start to put the responsibility back on the neighborhoods and the people and to have a plan. And this was a way that the fire department and volunteer fire departments or regional fire departments could get out and start messaging about preparedness, which we've linked to the Firewise program, Alertness, which we link to the NOAA radio system and other local community, and then evacuation. And he got in trouble because when they published this, the sheriff said, but I'm in charge of evacuation. And he said, fine. What's the message? Bob said, tell them to run. <laughs> you know, it's just like, we work together. It's about working together. You know that sheriff, don't you? In Colorado, it's the sheriff, right, that does evacuations. But I hear they do it fairly well because you've had a lot of practice. <laughs> so, just to get us thinking this morning, I'm starting with a quiz. Who knows the answer? Don't what do we have here? Don't we, have, we have three llamas, right? We have a beast, a priest, and a really big fire in the Northeast. A 3L llama. So today, I'm not used to the microphone if I, like, you can still hear me, right, if I, because I, like, have way too much energy. Three cups of coffee standing here. Since I'm good. We're going to talk about values, who, we're going to talk about core energy, how, how we show up. And it was a really big challenge. This morning, last night, Eric and I, do I wear the black pants that matches my suit jacket, or because... Or do I wear my khaki pants that's a little more laid back? And Eric said, you should probably wear shorts and clogs, George. You'd fit right in. <laughs> Didn't bring them with me. And then results. The what? What are we trying to get? So that's what we're going to talk about. I'm going to start with values. Values. 
values are, come from our beliefs, our expectations, our backgrounds. Who can tell me when values are formed in human beings? Any, any? Continuously. Continuously, they're being adjusted. How about our foundation values? H5. H5, how about a couple more years? 8 to 13. 8 to 13, some as early as 5, some as late as 19, you know, depending on what's going on in their family. Was there a sickness? Was there a uh, separation of parents? Was there September 11th happened? You know, what things happened as they were in those formative years to form their values? And there's different values we deal with. We can be different people. You know, at home in the wintertime, it was... A beanie hat, thank you Eric, I have a very nice one to add to my collection. Uh, a long sleeve t-shirt, shorts, and tevas. At work, it was a pressed white shirt, a black tie, patent leather shoes, pressed black pants. I had two different value sets going on, two different messages I was trying to send. Or maybe at home there wasn't really a message because I was too tired from work. So if you look at this slide, this is interesting. The, the fat guy in the white shirt with the mustache, is me 60, probably 45 or 50 pounds ago. Retirement is amazing. How it takes the stress off you. I retired as fire chief five years ago. And you can, what am I expressing there? What am I expressing? No, no, I did not. I'm at the end, I'm closest to my vehicle so I can leave. <laughs> uh, the guy standing at the top, and he's standing on a four inch berm from where we were cutting off the fire, he had to stand up there because he's only like this tall. So he stood up on the high thing. Uh, Rick Volek from Fish and Wildlife, fabulous, fabulous, fabulous guy. Um, if any of you Boy Scouts, Girl Scouts, you talk about grooming, it's a really, really bad thing, grooming people for naughty stuff with little children. He did this thing, grooming with me, which I'm going to talk about, to really bring me in to understand the wildfire issue in our community. And as you can see, there's these little scrub things, and there's these pine things, and there's these leaf things, and all of them catch on fire. <laughs> and between March and May, when our humidity drops below 40%, I know for you that it's rain, uh, but we drop below 40%, we have fires. And behind Rick, if you walk three miles, we had a major league subdivision, seven, ten square miles, that had wood shaped roof covered. And those folks, and wood chip groups aren't a problem in New England if you let the moss and the lichen and all that stuff. But they don't do that. They put bleach on it every spring so their roofs look new. And then they oxidize and they burn even faster. Job security for me. But this group was a group that we were in the National Wildlife, National Wildlife Refuge. And there were people from all different sorts of interdisciplinary groups. There's the fire chief at the end someone from the State Division of Fish and Wildlife. The guy hiding is the town planner, who is also a part of this group called Orinda Wildlife Trust. They believe, they, they were buying land and putting fences around it to keep people out. You have fences here to keep, oh, we've got a fan. We have fences here to keep animals off the road. They have fences to keep humans on the road, keep them out of the wildlife. Uh, the Mashpee Wampanoag tribe, one of the tribal elders, I don't know if he was an elder at the time, but he is now, Chucky Green, the state um, refuge steward. So our refuge was one of those checkerboards, had a bunch of different people. And then another uh, native person, and then the guy with his hands in his pocket, next to his vehicle was the, one of the FMOs for Fish and Wildlife, and he, did, he and I were bookends, we were standing at both ends. He wanted to leave too. He didn't want to be there. Because we were talking about that little scar on the tree and the beetles that we were going to attract. All right, more about this later. So values. In your, in your organization and yourself, your values. Can anyone share something you value or a value you have? Trust. Okay. Honesty. Trust. Honesty. You're going for the bold ones. Integrity. Integrity. Humor. Humor. That's one of my favorites. Humor. Timeliness. Is anyone timeliness? If you're if you're 15, if you're 10 minutes early, you're actually five minutes late. One of those timely people that the car's running and they leave. You home. Like I do with my children a couple times. 
So we all have these values. People on your team, here's an announcement if you didn't know it, be ready. They might have different values. Some folks on your team, you may evolve uh, trustworthiness. So I, I have a coach, I have a therapist, I have a dog, I have a whole team that takes care of me. But I used to, this was an easy question. Someone said to me, George, what are your values? Easy. Trustworthy, loyal, helpful, friendly, courteous, kind of obedient, gentle, thrifty, brave, clean, and any other boys' cuts? Reverend. That was easy. Eight to twelve. I was immersed in it. So my values. And if I start out and I lead with trust, I really don't know Eric. He hasn't paid me yet. Um, you know, but, I, but if I lead with trust, we can have a little issue going on here. And I learned through some work, some coaching, and some communicating, and some growing up, that kindness has to be my is is what I choose as my lead value now. And, and giving, and forgiveness, and some other things. So, you can do a values inventory. And at the end, I'm going to introduce to you a website you can go to. You can give me your coveted email address, and I will send you a values inventory worksheet that you can look at your values. It's got a bunch of words on it. You can add words to it. And if you're really fancy, you can go on wordcloud.something, and you can make one of these the word clouds of your values. What's really neat is you can do with your team. And this word.cloud.thing, if you put in honesty six times, it comes up bigger. If you put in timeliness once, and you start to see what your team, and you can actually frame this, and put it in your hallway to remind your team what your team values are. And then the dreaded Values collision. I value timeliness. Someone else values orderliness. I want to leave. They want to clean up. All right? I'll leave, leave the dirty dishes for group B. They'll get them. It's time for us to go home. Because I have somewhere else I need to be, and I'm starting to run late. And you can see how that person that, especially if I'm the high commander, and say we need to leave, and they'll leave a mess. And we start to have a values collision. We can have a breakdown on the team. Now if I know, as a good team leader, that someone values, maybe 10 minutes before it's time to leave, I could remind everyone, the bus is leaving at 7, but we need to clean up. And Eric's going to be in charge of that, so let's get started early. I'm picking on Eric, because he's pretty much, Eric and Brenda, I'll pick on Brenda in a few minutes. A lot of people don't remember their names. Um, and I should remember Brenda's because I already do it for 10 years. Uh, but the values collision can be, can be major league. Because if we look at this group, and, and this fire picture, that's a wildfire on Staten Island. It went to six alarms. I'm telling you. It was a big one. And yeah, the guys in shorts and not in PPE and, and, and all that nonsense. We can talk, you can argue with me later. But I thought it was really cool because I'm going to show you a picture later how they finally put it out. A really big fire. What's the value of those firefighters? What do they value? Safety. safety. Not insurance, but safety. They value safety. They value other people's safety beyond theirs. They value safety. The elected officials up in the corner, what do they value? Voters. Votes. Voter, votes. Job security. So do we, though. Um, but job security. Money, what else do they value? Power. Power. They want to make the decision, right? Burn, no burn. And then uh, down here, the homeowners. What do they value? Their homes. their homes, their property, maybe some seclusion, maybe some privacy that you're not going to tell me what to do? Okay, I'll put a red rock out in front of you. Didn't you? you guys know that story, right? The green rock, red rock. I love that one because a lot of people got in trouble. So it's fun hearing about that. But there's different values. And the firefighters, what do they want? What does the fire chief want? What, what was the secret I told the table I talked to in the back corner? When I went to town hall, they'd say, hey, chief, how's it going? What are you here for today? Meeting? Hearing? No, I'm here for more. More people. More trucks. More hose. More money. More. Firefighters want more. They want more help. They want to do a better job. What do the elected officials want? Less taxes. 
taxes so they get reelected. Spent less money on firefighters because they didn't vote for them in the last election, or whatever. And the homeowners, what do they want? They want what? Less taxes. Less taxes. They want to be left alone until that's knocking at their back door. Then they want our help, right? Yeah. So, so the values even switch. Well, let's go. So that's values again. One piece of how we make decisions, and one piece of how your team works together. And if you're bringing a collaborative, my Firewise friends, you know, if you're working with the fire chief, he or she's going to come in with a different set of values than the town planner or the economic development or the Arinda Wildlife Trust people who want to build a wall. So I'm going to shift now. I love the TED Talk idea because it taught me that I really need to do three in 45 minutes. We've got to shift gears and do a little. So we're going to talk about energy. As an executive coach, the, the school I went to taught us that how we show up is a choice. And, and, and I like to, to show that when, you know, when I walk in a room, most people say, hey, George is a really happy person. Why is that? Hey, George, how are you this morning? I am super fantastic. Some of you heard that from me. I'm great. Life is good. I, I, how I am is happy and positive. And they go, George, you can't be that happy and positive. I'm like, okay, ask me again. Hey, George, how are you? Ah, the bed, my back, flying, I got this migraine. The coffee. Don't you guys know where Seattle is? Come on, can we get some piece of coffee here? And they're like, oh. bring back happy joy. So how we show up can make a difference right in that first few moments. And that first few minutes. So the model I learned in coaching was how we show up as a choice. And this little graphic, I hope you can read it. If you can't, come up front and squint at it. We have seven levels of energy. The, uh, the, 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 the high commander, the doctor that put this model together, looked at people and came up with seven levels of energy. Starting at very low energy, level one. If you're in a building, what's the lowest story? Basement. During a tornado, where's the safest place to go? Basement. So level one is a protective energy, but it's victim energy. It's very low. And the core thought with level one energy is I lose, and you lose. Uh, Eric, you don't want me to come speak to you because I'm not very good. And people aren't going to be very happy. And you're going to be in trouble, and I'm going to be in trouble, and we're all going to eat dirt. Level one. Who knows people that walk around with level one energy? Who knows people when they're stressed? They run away. You know, kids sick, haven't had dinner yet. Have a presentation tomorrow morning. Go home, go to bed. I haven't seen them for three days. So love, this energy can show up every day. And there are some people that have had so much stress in their life that they show up every day in level one victim energy. It's a stress energy. Most people, and I've met, I've done over 200 of these. This is an analysis we do. There's a little uh, test we can send out, a little assessment. One person didn't have both level one and level two energy in their stress energy. Under stress, most people go to level one or level two, which is my favorite. This was my old stress energy. So level one is victim, and it's lethargy and apathy. I don't care, don't pick me. Level two is fight energy, it's anger energy. Still negative energy, because I win, and not only do I win, but you die. I mean, you lose. <laughs> when they did mine, mine was, and I'll show you in a moment, my, my assessment, they had to flip it sideways, because my level two, I was the chief, right? We had a union contract, we had fire codes, and then we had the rules that I made up just for when I needed my rules that I made up, because I was the chief. And no one wanted to be around me when I, because it wasn't I when you lose, it was I when you die. And so, Think of the people that are under stress. Under stress. Do you know someone, not you, because all of you are wonderful high energy people, but someone under stress, they start barking. 107 code CMR 3214. You cannot park your vehicle like that, or it will be towed down. And I happen to have a tow hook on my car, and I'm going to do it and ruin your car. 
You know those people, right? You didn't trim your weeds. Send it out my son with a mower. It's a park restaurant on the mower, of course. And we're going to charge you $372 to cut your lawn. Or a $500 fine. I am my son, pay the money. You know those people, they're out there. Push the button. You know, you work for one of those people, don't you? They're out there. They're out there. That was me. Until I realized, and, and I'm, is it the next one? So that's me, right? Six years ago. Level three energy. I win and I hope you win too. Car salesman. Hope you like the car. I know you want leather seats, but I got you this fine alpaca weave instead because it's the best we have. I hope you like the Well, it's cold here, right? I like alpaca weave instead of leather. I win, I hope you win too. Level three is starting to be positive energy because you're not trying to take out the other person. You're not looking at lose energy. You hope they win. Of course, after you win. After you get your commission, after you get your budget, after you get home for dinner. Whatever the thing that's important for you. Level three energy. Did I get you so far? You know where I'm going? Level four. What's the word underneath it? I can't read it on my glasses. Come, yeah. Level four is I win by you winning. I'm all about your win. Level four was my energy, right? The one on the right. That's my level four energy. I was all about the other person winning. All about the other person winning. Which is great. It's great to work for a boss or have a partner or a mate. That's level four energy. Because they're all about you. And you know those people. You know the person you can go to and say, hey, I can't get anyone to work overtime on July 4th on work. And I go, sure. I'm not allowed to swear. Darn, that's the 4th of July. I didn't put the two together. But I was always saying yes to that stuff. You know those people. You go to them and you abuse and use them. You take advantage of them, which is the problem with level four energy is eventually you get tired. Because you're working on the extra shifts. You're staying up at night on fire guard. You're, you're, you're staying back to wash the dishes and then paying for your own Uber to catch up with the crew. And, and you get tired, but level four is really that start of high energy. High energy. Level five. Level five. We all win or we don't play. We all win. So that person's really in it for the team to win and for themselves to win. Sure, I'll work July 4th, but I'm scheduled for Christmas. I'll swap. We'll work it. You'll win. I'll win. I get to win too. You know, we get to leave on time, so we can stop and get coffee. You know, working in, knowing what your team's win is, but also standing up for yourself. And level five is really great energy, because you start to sustain yourself. You know how, level four, you forget to stop and fuel, and you run out of gas. Level five, you're watching your fuel indicator too. Level five energy. Level six, there is no winning and losing. Everything is an opportunity. Do you know those people that they got flooded out, the game got canceled, and they end up sitting in a parking lot eating a cold hot dog? And they're like, man, I never realized how good a hot, a, a hot, hot dog was. It was great. They find something positive. And then you know them. He's sitting right there. Um, we know those people, they can make, you know, they don't really just make um, lemonade out of lemons. They have a whole party for everyone to enjoy it. Everything, everything. They get to the point where, you know, they realize that that horrible divorce 10 years ago gave you two wonderful children, one who just graduated college. And they start to acknowledge that without those, at the time, were bad experiences, were really experiences that gave you other experiences. So that level six energy is those people that everything is a lesson. Everything is a lesson. And I say those people, the level six choice. These are choices too. So as a level four person, I can choose to see the learning and see the learning in the group. That if you, if you left an angry meeting, what did you learn? What do you move on for next time? Level seven. No one lives at level seven, but level seven energy is nothing is real. It's all we made up. The only reason we call this a microphone, do you know why we call this a microphone? 
because some dude at some point said, hey, that's a microphone. So we all call, you know, this is a table because we call it a table. It's what we made up. It's the rules we live by. And the level seven person can see past those rules. Like the dude at MIT right now that's taking some Harvard stuff and now at MIT, they're using a sound wave to extinguish fire. Have you heard about that? It's wicked cool. I'm, wicked means good. I'll translate for you. Wicked is good. It's wicked cool that they can take this antenna, wave it over a trash bucket, and put the fire on. And they called me up because they saw that I was on these Wi-Fi and We want to strap these antennas to planes, and we want to drive over wildfire, fly over wildfires, and send our sound wave and put the fire out. Stops combustion. I'm like, what about the other parts of the fire triangle? Does it stop the heat? No. I said, okay, so you put the fire out and the wind blows and the fire comes back. Okay, we're going back to the lab. <laughs> but in a submarine, right? Put one of those little antennas every 15 feet in a submarine and they don't have to use hal halogenated gases or other things that can, you know, stop oxygen so the fire goes out because you can't breathe but neither can the crew. Um, so, you know, it's an idea that they're, they're working with the OD now to, to put the fire out. But that's, that's level seven. That's like, there are no rules. You know, they have these great ideas until level four comes along and says, you can't do that. Um, so, energy. Talk to me about energy. Tell me a level one experience some of you have had. Anyone? Teammate. Yourself. When's the day you showed up at work and you were like, make it work? Anyone? Well, level two, that's my favorite. Can you think of level two people that you work with? You can think of, you don't want to talk about it because they're sitting at your table, right? Uh, and they might talk to you. But, but these energies are choices. And so when I had this done, level four, I just done, and I haven't updated my slides too well because I don't, right now, I don't, love, I get rid of my level four energy and I am a six, five now. I lead with five, we all win, and I go to six. And they're really close. Because I realize that I get to win two that I do get the afternoon off to go mountain biking yesterday. And we saw a snake. We were about this big. And it still was a snake. And, and the, man, there was some healthy moose out at the back of Crested Butte. Man, they were healthy. There was one sick moose, though, because it kind of like, either it stepped in it or just like kept walking on the trail. But man, there were some healthy moose. I can't wait to get out there later and see if we can find them. But that's my level six, my new level six energy. It's, you know, looking for the excitement and stuff. And I've actually reduced my level two in fighting, and I have a little bit more victim energy in my stress. But if you ask Brenda, Brenda, which would you prefer? A little more victim or a little more fighter? She wants three, she wants me to go up to we, uh, we win, and I at least figure out her one. So Brenda and I did this in coaching school, and this is great for a team. Because if you look at stress at the time, I went to level two, Brenda went to level one, one of our kids is sick and we haven't eaten yet and we have overtime shift tomorrow and we're both under stress. And Brenda goes to the basement and I go pound on the door for her to let me in so I can blame her for the kids being sick. Even though I'm the one that gave them the corn dogs for dinner the night before. I'm still blaming her because she should have known better to throw them out. Doesn't work well in a relationship. Until we looked at it, we were standing at, in our coaching chair looking and going, we have to choose to act differently to each other because we care about each other. We made a promise to care about each other, and we made that promise before it didn't work, so we're going to make sure this promise works. So this really helps us. But on the team, to know, you know, if you know you go to fight energy, sometimes that's really good. Two o'clock in the morning, tree on a car, kid trapped in the car. You know, maybe I am going to get my crew going by using some foul language. And, but you're not going to beat your crew up when it's over. You know, you're going to convert back. Take that stress energy, put it in some level two, and then quickly realize you're doing it and move on. And you can see with Brenda, lots of level five energy. She's and in our company, in our team, there's three coaches. Brenda's all about us all winning, figuring out a way. I'm figuring out a way for the team to be happy in my old days. Now I'm just sitting there learning and smiling, and they wonder if I really care. Because the higher energy you get, sometimes you get disconnected. So what do you think about this energy model? Any MBTI folks here? Any DISC people here? The thing with MBTI and DISC is DISC, I, I'm an I, 
So I, I'm like, believe it or not, I'm an extrovert. But that's who I am. With the energy model, I can choose. And sometimes I have to, you know, when, when we said yes to this conference, and I say yes because Brenda and I make some of these business decisions together, that's what's my intention. My intention is to meet more people, have a learning experience, go to Colorado, on someone else's budget. And uh, you all knew that, though. But, but to share this stuff and have fun. You know, make an intention of having fun. And, and this morning, Brenda says to me again, what's your intention today? Connect, share this stuff because it's neat, and have fun. High energy. Choose high energy. And some people could choose stress energy because sometimes it works. But this is neat stuff. You can use it or not. And I'll gladly, if anyone wants more information about it, I'll gladly share it. So looking at this group, what do you think my energy was there? I kind of told you, right? No flipping, flapping way are we going to burn, right? You want to do what? You want to put fire on these little grasses and leaves and burn them? Like on purpose? The lady next to me in the blue jacket, what do you think? She's got a clipboard in her hand? Three-ish. Yeah, a little three. Yeah, you can win, but man, I'm not getting in trouble. i got to win first. We, we will make this safe. The Native American guy, Chucky, Chucky, oh, uh, the guy who can't see, uh, standing the third person, the town planner. If the boss knows I'm here, I'm going to get in trouble. If we get a moth uh, infestation, I'm going to get in trouble. If the chief scratches his car one more time, they're going to blame me, and I'm going to get in trouble. Cape Cod pinch right, right driving through the scrub oak. Um, the, the Native American guy, what do you think he was all about? Why was he there? We've been burning. We've been burning. Blueberries. <laughs> he was there about their native blueberries. And they've been burning. So where we were was the summering grounds. It was uh, half a mile from the ocean. This is where the Wampanoag tribe summered. Then we had a big lake six miles inland. And when they left their, their, their summer grounds, they burned it. So when they came back, the blueberries were beautiful and they came back in the spring. But also, the other Wampanoags from the other areas didn't want to go live there because there was nothing left. They burned it. It, it did some public health stuff. It did some uh, rejuvenation stuff. It did a bunch of stuff. And they've been burning forever and ever and ever. You're laughing, right? But they did, right? And the better tribe was the one who was further down, you know, up the river, right? But they tell me, Chucky told me stories of this, their oral tradition. The steward guy, level four, he wanted us all to be happy. He didn't want anyone to get in trouble for that scar, that the, uh, the big agitator, masticator thing. Man, he put a Volkswagen in front of that thing, I bet it would be gone. That thing chewed trees up great. We switched to a smaller one because of the National Heritage stuff. If we brought up any Indian artifacts, and we knew this was their big summer ground, our project would have been done. So it was really good because when we came out, this was uh, after day half. We did a half day of grinding. And uh, Chucky said, I don't want this project to stop. And if you bring up any artifacts, we're done. Get a smaller machine, don't go as deep. Because we want to keep getting rid of this stuff. So some high energy stuff going on there. All right, next TED Talk. Any questions about energy? So results. Have you ever heard be, begin with the end in mind? Have you ever heard of that begin with the end in mind? Is that uh, Senek? Did he write that book? Begin, begin with the end in mind. Begin with the end in mind. So the results system, we look at the end, but we also look at the pieces and parts that get us to results. And we have the visible side, our goals, our choices, and our actions. It's the stuff everybody sees. Your annual plan, your strategic plan, your five-year goals. And the actions you take, showing up at meetings, choosing the right clothes, bringing the team together. And then there's the hidden part, the perceptions, beliefs, the habits, the expectations that, again, we developed between 8 and 15. That's the stuff behind the curtain, the Wizard of Oz, if anyone's calling for the bathroom key back at work, I've got extras, those Model 37s, they fit almost. No. Sometimes you check in at the conference. We're out of paper towels. Right? Yeah, dry your hands in the 
So the result system looks behind the curtain and looks at our values, our perceptions, and beliefs. And it's great to work with a team if you can start to uncover, again, the values, perceptions, and beliefs. So if you have a group together, my Firewise folks, the community people, what are some of the beliefs you have around wildfire? What do you believe about it? You don't believe. It's a fallacy. What do you, what do you believe? Wildfire can be healthy. Wildfire can be healthy. My fire folks, what do you believe about wildfire? What do you believe? You believe the health, what else do you believe? It could kill somebody? It could kill you, I hope you believe that. So you take care of yourself. Because you're important if you're not here tomorrow, and you're not going to be there with the fire out. What do you, fire folks, what do you perceive about the fire watch people? What do you perceive about them? They're there to help you. They're there to watch you, to make sure that they get it their way. I mean, we come with perceptions and beliefs. And they're not good or bad. They just are. They just are. So the results system starts to look at that. And then we talk about results. You talk about goals. So the result, if we look at a result, who would like to be financially free? Financially worry-free. Who would like that? What do you got to do to be financially worry-free? What do you got to do? Stop, Stop worrying. That's level six, right? Just learn. I will learn about that. Um, so, make more money in my job, get a raise. Have some savings. These are all goals, right? I want a goal at the end of the year to have $30,000 in the bank. That's a goal. But the result is financially worry-free. Pay off all debts. So if you can think of the results, if you can shift to really say, what's so the goals of, of a program, a community firewise program, and I'm gonna pick on you folks because you I can see you really clearly. But the results, the, the goals are you might have a goal, yesterday somebody talked about 80% chipping, you might have a goal of 30% limb clearing. But really, why are you doing all this? To make it safer. So the result you're looking for. So if you can key in on the results, because if you look back at if my cohesive strategy, there's many paths back to Denver, right? We can choose 50 to 280 something. We can choose the, we can stay on this road out here, right? We can keep going and eventually get you to Aspen, but you better have my minivan's not gonna get me there. The rental minivan that I didn't get, the four wheel drive so I could play. But we could get there different ways. But the result is the same. Knowing that when you bring your group together, if you focus on the result, if you put early on, uh, incident command, right? Big, big fires, we'll put the, the result of the day. We want to hold it to so many acres. We want to have so many people not, you know, we want to hold the injuries down. You know, whatever the goal of the day, the result of the day is. And then the ops team and the planning team go out and then do the goals and do the needs, the needs assessment and stuff. So, because there's many ways we could get to it. Oh, we can bring in 35 tankers, right? That's an airplane with what? See, me tankers are six wheels and pump. But, because we don't follow these in the Northeast. But, oh, all the tankers are in California. So, we can still get the results, but we need, instead of six tankers, we need 52 Type 3 engines. We can't do that. Okay, seeding and a rain dance. You know, you, you just, you, but you keep looking at the results. Looking at the results, and then looking at your goals for the day. So, when you're doing this type of stuff, when you're working with a team, I ask you to consider these. What are the benefits I see in achieving my desired results? The benefits of me being financially worry free is I'm not spending time looking at my smartphone and my bank account. I'm not worried. I'm not renting the cheapest car on Amazon or Google or TripAdvisor and ending up with a van. I'm going right to Hertz and getting the four-wheel drive. So the benefits of achieving my results. What's the benefits of a Firewise community? And write those benefits down. The things I tell myself about the ability to achieve my results. 
Rick Volokh, the, for, the Fish and Wildlife guy, was probably saying, Chief Baker is a real pain in my neck. That wasn't the word he used. We'll never get this done with him. Or someone on the crew was saying, we'll never get this done with him. And he was saying, give me time. Give me time with Chief Baker. We'll, we'll figure this out. But tell yourself the negatives. What's holding you back from getting this done? Contract on Chief Baker. We'll get it done. In working to achieve my desired results, I expect the politicians are going to want a budget. I expect that the union's going to want overtime. Because if we're bringing in volunteers, well, we're, we worked in a union environment. And it said they had the first refusal for all work. Good, good linguists that did that, right? Because they could say volunteers are doing work that we shouldn't have volunteers. And, but if I expect that, I can talk to them ahead of time. Instead of, you know, if I can look at the things that are going to hold me back early, I can start to talk to people about it. Or I can ignore it and wait for a fight. Other thoughts that might help me achieve my desired results. What are other thoughts? Here's where we get that level six, level seven energy. What are some other things we could be doing to get our results? The thoughts that might interfere with achieving my desired results are. Look at all the pieces of your result system that's getting in your way. That's right. And then take those negative pieces and reframe them. And this was done with a, a police department. I was working with a police department, had a new command staff. And their patrol folks were afraid to make a decision. Because the chief before them, if you were going to tow a car in certain neighborhoods, you had to check with the chief. This was a 36 person small community police department. You had to check with the chief before you towed cars in certain neighborhoods. You had to check with the chief before certain people were arrested. You had to check with the chief before you authorized overtime. Pretty much, 24-7, had to check with the chief. Now, how does that work when you've got an event going on and the school's overcrowded and the fire department calls you and asks you to write tickets for parking in the fire lane and you've got to call the chief and he's at a Red Sox game and he's not answering his phone. You're afraid that you're going to tow the wrong car, right? So what do you do? What do you do? Nothing! You do nothing. What's the worst thing a law enforcement officer can do? Is start to have a culture of doing nothing. Because they get killed, right? I mean, they're law enforcement right now. Any of you LA do law enforcement stuff? I mean, do I pull my gun out? What's the videotape going to say? You know, do I tase them? Do we pepper spray them? Do we shoot them with a bean bag? Pull your gun out and get them to stop before you start. You know, they're thinking all these things as the purpose either running at them or running away from them. And they have fear. And fear caused complacency. They weren't making decisions. Their arrest numbers were going down, which isn't really a number you look, you know, it's not the best number to look at. But they had numbers, their metrics were going down. Some of their crime areas were going up. Complacency led to indecisiveness. Again, we don't want an indecisive police officer. And going through this process, what behavior does it lead to? Complacency. What's the result? Indecisiveness. Danger. You're not that old here, but danger Will Robinson, right? Bad things are going to happen for indecisive police officers. And here's the magic in this tool. You work your way down to what it leads to. It leads to danger. What's the opposite of danger? You can read it right. Safety. safety. What do they need in their police department for safety? They need decisive police officers. And the chief was really brave to have the new chief to have me come in and do this. Because there's some words now. We need this, our police officers need to be decisive. What do you need in a police department for those street officers to be decisive? Trust. So, what behavior, what result do you really want? What behavior will you need to engage in? Decisiveness. What belief do you have to have? Trust. What actions do you need to build trust? And my arrows should have been the other way, but 
I was so excited that they came up with these answers when I was doing this. This is from their activity, this, this chart paper. And the, the sergeant said, we need to ride with our patrolmen. And the lieutenant said, no, you don't. You need to be sergeants. We need to ride with the patrolmen. As patrolmen, they take off the white shirt, put on a blue shirt, and ride with them, and mentor them, and teach them, and groom them, and do those things to build that trust. So, and the chief, what did the chief need to do? The chief needed to recognize what they were doing right, number one, because we do better when we're told, we'll do it right again if we're told we're doing it right. If we're doing it wrong, we'll do it wrong again, because we're focusing on the doing it wrong. And they started a program where the sergeants were assigned mentor duties to the new patrol officers from a different shift. And, and there was a, you know, we had to spend some time and some things that, what about the chain of command? No, no, no chain of command in this, it's learning. So we worked out a way that, you know, to empower the patrolman to go back to their sergeant. Lieutenants ended up taking shifts. The chief actually, once a month, rode a shift in a marked car with someone, or if they were low, if they were low, he was in a car by himself, if they were down to three officers. And, uh, and he wore a patrolman's badge, and the sergeant would usually have him do traffic duty somewhere. Uh, we had to you know, go direct traffic or go help the kid. You know, let the chief do the stuff that they didn't want to do. But that built trust. It was really amazing. Really, really amazing. And they're, they're doing good things. They, they don't even call it community policing anymore. It's just policing. They, the, the police chief sits at their community library every Thursday between 9 and noon. Brings his laptop, does his work. Anyone can, because I saw you at the police station the other day. Is everything okay? Instead of, hey, you were chatting with the chief at the library. You know, different, so he came out of his element. Some neat stuff came out of this. We actually did, I actually did his own results roadmap before we did this. And uh, it was pretty funny because when we were doing the, the uh, expectation parts, none of the sergeants said save me. Because it had been, safety had been taken away from them. And uh, they didn't put safety as one of the things they did well. And they're pretty sad, pretty scary. But that's going on. I mean, it's microcosm of what's going on in our culture. So, remember the big fire I showed you in the beginning in the east? That fire that I showed you, actually, this, this is mitigation that we're doing after the fact. Uh, Dave Crary, do you know Dave from the Park Service? You know Dave? Dave and another guy were watching this on the news. They called, uh, is it Fresh Kills National Park? They said, hey, we get the mower this week. Why don't we come down? So the next morning, they strapped on their trailer on their Type 6 engine, and they drove four and a half hours to New York City with the red lights on. Dave said it was the longest he's ever had the red lights on his entire career. Drove to New York City, put the lawnmower out. Two Park Service employees in a lawnmower with, I call it a lawnmower, but it was a big tractor with wheels and, and, and stuff. And they circled the fire, and they circled the fire, and two guys in four hours in a lawnmower put out a fire that six alarms in New York City. So six alarms brings you two four-man engines, uh, four four-man engines, two six-person ladder trucks, a heavy rescue, and a chief. So multiply that, and you get your shoes out and you do it. Because there was like 100 people there, and they couldn't put the fire out. And New York City said, and that's uh, the battalion chief of planning, we got to do this different. <coughs> and they started, uh, the Phragmites, they started doing fire breaks around the Phragmites. And that's uh, a fish and wildlife vehicle out of New Jersey that was 35 minutes away. They didn't even know it was there. But it was changing that paradigm because the different groups started talking to each other and started doing it differently. Because that house that's there, there's like 700 more houses. And uh, those fires end up being huge, huge fires that gets into those subdivisions or, or those parts of the community. So, I can see some of you are like, George, you didn't answer the question that you started with. What happened with Grumpy Chief Baker? What did Rick do? Rick brought in his crew, and I said, the first thing we need is all the roadsides cleared back, because we don't want to scratch our trucks 
and we want to be, but it was really, we were starting to build defensible space on the roadways, so we could go and fight the fire from the road. I could do that. He brought three guys, three people from Maine. I say guys, it was actually two women and a guy. And three folks from New Jersey, and they spent two weeks chipping and cutting and chipping and cutting and grinding. And they actually let our folks come out, and he said, you can come and we'll teach you how to do it. But you need chaps. What are chaps? So that I got one movie. Change our chaps. We didn't have change our chaps in our fire department. Could cut. So right there, when number one, we had a fire three months later. One of the guys from the military reservation, the saw bucked, and he got six months off. Not for punishment, for leg surgery, to reconstruct his leg. My guys said, you all say, hey, George, that is like idiot, idiot. We didn't know better. You know, there's another slide I have that talks about, you know, we know what we know, and we don't know what we don't know. We didn't know that, but we learned. So the, the, these, these fish and wildlife people did some great stuff for us. And then uh, we did all the, the work. We did all the work. We actually got fire shelters. Because I told the guys about screaming and yelling under our brush trucks with sprinkler systems going when fire burned over us at the Mass Military Reservation. Called for our mom a lot of times. But then we got up, kept on the fire out. But we had fire shelters. Those are actually the old ones. I'm like, Rick, I can't afford fire shelters. I know where three dozen of them are being thrown out. And if you're there at a certain time, because an old fire shelter is better than no fire shelter. And now the guys, the new chief, was more wildfire savvy than I was. They all have the backpacks and the stuff, and sports bars and different things. But we got our groups together. And, and what did we do? Rick looked at the result. He started. So what, what I taught you is really in reverse. When you're doing stuff, start with the end in mind. What is the result you're looking for? And really, go deep. Go deep. The result we're looking for is um, defensible space around the houses. Why? So they can be safer. Why? So we have, and then that third or fourth why will really be the result you're looking for. And those are just goals. Review your values. Look at your group. Do, do kind of like a values forecast on the people that are coming in the room. Or if you're really brave, if you're starting a new group, do a value survey. And do a cloud. So your group knows what their values are. And then choose your energy. Middle of the night, downtown Dallas, two people are coming up from behind. I'm not going to choose we all win. Not going to do that. I'm going to choose fight back and run. So that I don't want to give you this, this perception that everything is peaches and greens. There are days that level two or level three energy might be the best you get out of it because of the situation you're in. But ask yourself, what does level one look like? What does level two look like? What does we all win? Have you ever asked your team what their win is? Have you ever asked your customers what their win is? What's, what's in it for them? What's, what's the most important thing for them? Back in January, we were doing a planning, and we did this annual planning thing with our clients. And there were six goals. What's the most important thing for you? For me, the most important thing for me was my health. I have six little nodules because I was a firefighter and I breathed battery acid a long time ago. Not on purpose. Uh, although some of my friends in high school might uh, and, and I was on 100 milligrams of prednisone, and if any of you know, 60 milligrams is the top dose. And I was on three breathing meds. And I said, this is nonsense. I can't do this anymore. And I made health my priority. Most important thing for me. So whenever I made a decision, What's this house? First thing I'd say is how is this going to affect my health? So figure out for your team what's the most important. And because I said to Brendan it's the most important thing, we started you know one of those shake diets. I dropped 30 pounds. I rode the PMS challenge 200 miles in two days. I did it back in August. Uh, I couldn't climb the stairs at the Quincy Adams Tea Station outside of Boston, which was like seven seven twenty because I couldn't breathe. But so so my message to you is. Figure out your energy. What's your win? Figure out your values. And this is who I am. Oh, what's it saying down there at the bottom? Oh, it's okay. Eric's getting an email. That's fun when you use someone else's computer and you start seeing an office fight showing up on your PowerPoint presentation. <laughs> no! The budget is this. 
So George at innovation.com, email me any questions you have. We, uh, we actually have, a, and I'll ask your organizing person, oh, Brenda's telling me, we have a QR code on our phones, Brenda and I, Brenda's in the back corner there, wait Brenda, that if you want the value survey, go over to Brenda, shoot the QR code, and come to me, I'll put my phone off the side, shoot the QR code, I'm gonna give Eric and the organizer folks the link, so one of the emails that you get out that say, you know, don't forget to check your room for stuff. Also, here's George's link. Go to that. You can get the values tool. After you do the values tool, if you want a half hour of my time or Brenda's time, if you like her better, um, she's much nicer than I am. You saw it, right? Level six. Um, we'll gladly coach you on, on the values of your team to show you what this stuff is. And how does that help me? You say, well, this stuff is really cool. And if you start to learn this stuff, maybe you'll find a coach in your area, you'll reach out to me again to come back to Steamboat Springs next spring, is that where we're going? Uh, that's the vote right now, but putting undue pressure on Eric. Uh, I like Estes Park myself, really big trout, big time uh, That's my vote, although I don't have a vote. Uh, and then my, my thing is, how can I help you? So it's been a pleasure to be here with you. Does anyone have any questions? Yes. The, I think it's the slide before that. These things. Which, yes. Which are the ones? So just. So if you come up with a negative, if you come up with a negative, we don't have enough money. We don't have enough money. What's the opposite of we don't have enough money? We got to find a different way to do it. There are level six. There are other opportunities. The fire chief is a jerk. The other side is the fire chief can work with us, and we need to find a way to work with the fire chief. And finding action items instead of negative items, instead of we don't have, here's what we need to do to flip that. And I'm joking, you're, I talked to a couple fire chiefs. Your fire chiefs from Colorado are wicked cool. And, you know, I don't know if it's because like they wear clogs to work or Tevas or they bring their dog to work. I don't know what it is. Is the air better? I don't know what it is, but. All right, I didn't meet all of them. There's probably a jerk somewhere. But the, guy, the, the folks I met, uh, cool guys. Cool guys. And probably cool gals, too. Do you have women fire chiefs in Colorado? Yeah. Massachusetts has a few. It's, they bring another view, and it's fabulous. Another question? One more. You want? One more question. So, advertisement. I'm on again at sometime after this. You have it here. 11 o'clock. I don't want to watch it anymore. 11 o'clock. And what we're going to do at 11 o'clock is you're going to come in with the hardest, most difficult challenges, and we're going to, as a group, reframe them. And I'm going to talk about team agreements. I'm going to talk about how you have quality conversations with people that aren't actually doing the things you want them to do. There's a way that you can tell someone they're a jerk and they'll agree with you. I'll teach you that. And, uh, yeah, you want that, don't you? Uh, and, uh, and we're just going to continue more fun that we're having here. So again, my pleasure. Thank you, for, Eric. Thank you for finding me a little while ago. And uh, Brenda and I are here. If you have any questions, come see us. Thank you very much.